Hey guys. Hello. Welcome back to Wandering Into Wellness. Uh, Finn and Lydia here, your regulars, and with a, an irregular regular, <laughs> regular to my shop that is, uh, yeah. is Lorraine Darcy. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Lorraine, thank you very much for coming on. You're very welcome. This is so good. Um, so there's something we were just talking about in the car on the way across. We've dealt so much with other aspects of health in terms of internal health, environmental things, you know, nutrition and you know maybe emotional aspects of we haven't really dealt with kind of a fundamental part of it which is the architecture of our environment and how our environment really influences us in the in a, from a built point of view yep and uh so you're an expert that's great <laughs> <laughs> let's call the expert uh, the ghostbusters when it comes to this i mean like we were trying to even when we were trying to do your introduction uh last night i was trying to even work out like because lydia has never met you before so i was like okay look at her twitter feed i went your twitter uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to get this right. <laughs> you're but okay. You're, it's a PhD in, oh, okay. So like built form so, in, yeah. go, there's like the seven things essentially. Yeah, yeah. So built environment, uh, health, yeah. physical okay. activity, um, transport, um, social cohesion, I think is in there. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> well done, yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. It, it, it's a lot. It's but, a I mean, lot. But yeah. that's what that's what the environment does for us, doesn't it? Yeah. Like it encompasses mm. so much. Like it's kind yeah. of it feeds us in so many different ways. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it can, the built environment is recognised as one of the main determinants of health. Yeah. And um, you know, because even when we look at things like, oh, you know, let's go for a really far out one, but even addiction, all right? Yeah. And it, it, when we look at that, we, there's actually cues and indicators in our environment which can actually make us more susceptible to being around people who might lead us into that interesting and for even example. for example if we live in a um, lower socioeconomic area for example and there is signs of um, antisocial behavior or groupings of people and I really struggle with the term antisocial behavior because sometimes it's some of the most social behavior. Yeah. People just perceive it as antisocial, but these are people that are grouped together and talking. Yeah. But if the activity they're engaging in is actually something like drug usage or something like that, you're you know, you're you're engaging with people in your community, but unfortunately it comes with an ill. But often these are happens in places that are not overlooked. So if we design places that we can't see like people in their homes can't look over or people walking don't see them yeah. it's more often ills you know that are happening so like but, but i mean what's what's the difference between that and a pub i mean that's just because we've decided certain types of behavior in certain yeah. environments aren't okay like it's not okay to sit around drinking cans in the park yeah but it's perfectly fine to do that in a, in a, in a yeah. pub and to yeah. you know and, and to do all sorts of other things but yeah. let's not go there Perce like this, right? yeah but it's, it's a perception it's uh, people's yeah. perception of it and then, why is it anti-social then what's like is it because just because it excludes others or uh, people have a perception that they are potentially going to be endangered to by those okay. people okay. It's okay. Like, and and what you'll find is the more that somebody walks past that group of people that actually they don't feel so it's, yeah. it's when someone is new to an area that they perceive to be in danger from this but you'll find if you survey people who live in that neighborhood they don't see it they don't see them as a problem and yeah. you know they often they know them and they say hi to them yeah it's it, it, yeah, yeah but it's really interesting. I, I, I know i went really far with that one but even when people are trying to you're trying to change a habit or a behavior yeah. which um changing the environment even subtly even moving the cups in someone's house when they're making their cup of tea that if they automatically go for a biscuit with a cup of tea if they have to go to another place for their cup they don't it makes them think and stop and go i'm not having my biscuit today instead of automatically reaching for it so yeah. it's ingrained in our neuro the neuroscience of it yeah that's amazing and so when it comes to like putting a park in the middle of so we're in weaver park in cork street we should probably say where we are mm -hmm. so weaver park is a really interesting park it just opened up last year i think wasn't it um, it's actually neighbors of mine who designed it who are the architects okay. they're the, the landscape architects for it but um because it's not i mean it's not pretending to be the countryside it's no. definitely is in the middle of the city and like we're sitting on the set on the side of a of a, of a skate rink skate rink no uh skate park rink, i think probably puts me out of the context of being a person who's going to use this yeah well <laughs> listen we knew that <laughs> but, but even michael d's been on this one. i think he's been on this one has he yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on wearing all of the pads um on a skateboard in it i think he was meant to be just for a photo app and to, he actually got on the skateboard kind of enjoyed it. Wow. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was here. It might have been somewhere else, but I think it was here. Yeah. So when it comes to like these things, when you're putting um, things in place where you want people to use them, mm -hmm. how do you manage to make it? So, I mean, what, what, what elements are here that are going to act, are going to influence behavior change, going to improve socialization within this community that you can kind of see looking around? Oh, it's, it's, it's the complete in, in, um, 
inclusiveness for everybody yeah. is the first one. Yeah. That there's no wall. If you notice, there's no wall around the edge of it, no. and the gates aren't locked. Yeah. Because there's this perception, it's kind of this defensive space, and it belongs to somebody else if they're locking me out at night. Yeah. Whereas if this is open and anybody can walk through here at any time of the day, that's just, it feels more like it's part of my community and I belong here too. Yeah. And that's really important. And we have, um, yeah, there's a space for everybody here. There's, you know, you have your low benches, um, you know, that are very accessible. So anybody with any mobility needs, there's no steps. Um, you know, even on the, the on the sides, you can see their little ramps up, and they, they what they do is they encourage natural play and natural risk taking, learning about risk for small children. Okay. And this is something that's really important in um, playground design, but even just in in design of parks. Um, okay, I, I I'm, going, I'm jumping into really serious things very fast, but uh, yeah. Um, one of the most profound talks I ever heard was around playground design and the need to include risk and fear in, in, in into our built environment for our children. Um, and it, he went to the point, he started talking about um, one, the first major school shooting in the US. And um, one, uh, uh, an uncle of one of the victims in his grief became obsessed with why would somebody do this? And he, a psychologist himself, he got permission to interview um, the guy who'd done the shooting. And he said the one thing that really stood out to him, that he was never allowed to play with the other kids. He was always really protected as a child. And he got permission then to, to interview everybody in that prison, um, in that high security prison. And it was the one thing that every single one of them had in common. Wow. Yeah, like every single one? Every single one. Now, this is what I heard. I was, wow. Yeah. And then um, he went and this this guy who was presenting like compared it to the wild, and he said that like lion cubs and animal play was the name of the book. I'm, I've yet, I, keep, I still have it in my in my brain, and I must read it sometime. But he was mentioning lion cubs that um, a, a lion cub that was more protected by their mother was much more likely to be suicidal. Was the term they used? But what it was was that when when the cubs all played together, they knew that like, you know, they were all testing each other out and they weren't annoying each other and they kind of learned the social boundaries of what was acceptable or not in their peer group. And um, so it, a, a, a cub that wasn't able to engage in that or wasn't allowed to engage in that was much more likely to walk over to the alpha male and go, come on, play with me, play with me. And the alpha male just go and no more cub. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And it was like learning that wow. risk and the limitations of that risk. Okay. So um, with children... Before you turn out into the big wide world. Before you turn out into the big wide world. So if we think about the, the trip to school and what we would have done as kids is that you were dropped off at the gate or you were sent off in the school bus and you got off at the far side mm. and you walked that last bit and you decided which group of kids you went to play with mm. or whether you wanted to join in the game and there was no supervision of it. Yeah. You had to make decisions. Or even when you arrived early for sports, you kind of there was a pickup game do I join that one or this one and there was a decision making in that and you kind of figured out where you belonged in that and how to interact with that we have taken that away we have designed that out we now have kids being dropped to the gate and um, go straight into the school supervised scenario told who to sit with play with even at lunch times collected from the gate go to their sports club have, parents have to stay with the children until you know things start and are finished and again it's all you're in that group you're in that group Oh, we've removed that decision making. You're not picking your peers. Yeah. yeah, you're not picking your peers and you're not learning that, you know, you're not deciding for yourself what is... Where the boundaries are. Where the boundaries are, what's yeah. safe, what's not. It's, I mean, like, does it... It probably speaks a little bit to where... What you're talking about addictions initially as well, because you sort of feel like if people are opened up to opportunities... Like, it's always the kids who are... Well, not always, but, like, a lot of the kids who are kind of opened up to drinking at home a little bit mm. earlier on and... Mm the ones who didn't have to sneak out the back door and climb out their bedroom window and go and do it that tend to end up in a better place with their you know their their relationship with alcohol and i'd say it's the same party for a lot of social behaviors not just addictions yeah um, and like and then and I, like i wouldn't claim to be an expert in that but that risk and that that learning and making decision making around it and in relation to playground design why it is important is that children learn how high they can climb themselves and they won't climb any higher than they are comfortable. And they, yes, some, they'll fall, but they'll learn. Or when they're jumping a dike, or when they're, you know, when they're doing any kind of that engaging natural play, there's a constant decision making around it. But if we design our playgrounds where they think they have to be able to climb, and the amount of parents will say, go on, go on, go up it, because the parents perceive it to be safe because it was designed for children. But the child themselves, you know, often will be going, no, I can't. And, you know, but they're being pushed on it rather than learning flat for themselves and let them fall let them like learn the consequence of that and go again yeah. 
So how we design, and like, this is a great example of that, that you have the natural play around the, the playground, but, e but there's a lot of natural um, kind of climbing through tunnels, climbing over things, different levels yeah. within the playground. That's cool. And that's that sensory interaction as well, because that's the other thing I think that's massively lacking now is that yeah. kind of sensory play where before it would have been kind of, certainly when I was a kid, a lot of play was just, you're just out and there's nothing. Yes. And then you're in the mud and you're climbing trees and you're building forts and doing that stuff and you're naturally engaging in those kind of tactile senses and understanding all that and getting yeah. that, you know, that pressure work and that sensory work to your hands and we don't have that so much anymore. So it's really important for them to be doing that crawling and climbing and yeah. going over things and engaging with grass. And I feel like there's been like a massive evolution in terms of playgrounds. Like I now look at playgrounds as places I want to go. I'm like, yeah. oh my god, look at that. <laughs> Look at those rings, look at those bars. I'm like, you get me in like, okay, children out of the way, sorry, I've got something I've got to do yeah, over here. Yeah, like yeah. they look they're looking they're amazing these days. It's not just swings and seesaws. Mm -hmm. In fact there's are there any swings or seesaws now? There aren't. It's just climbing stuff. And there's, yeah. there's a couple of slides, but it's um it's largely about just climbing and finding like your way around a, essentially a building, isn't it? Yes. Which yeah. is great. And so with when you did you find was your own when you had kids, did that evolve your mindset around this stuff? Did that change? And yeah. did you I mean it must be difficult to resist being protective, right? When you have your own. Yes, uh, but I grew up in the countryside. Okay. I grew up very, <laughs> very, very rural. And, you know, we just, I have like, I have three sisters and a brother and it was like, you know, there was others, everyone else was at least a quarter of a mile away from us. So you kind of, okay. we were out around the yard and the farm and yes, took a few knocks. Yes, you kind of, you found your own and it was, there was a lot of imaginative play, but there was a lot of going down the streams on your own, you know, and stuff. But it, so I never thought I'd live in a city. I really didn't and I, I you know it's still there's still part of me that thinks I, I, I don't want to live here, but I actually really do and just yeah. even walking through the liberties on the way here I might go in this kind of community I love it you know it's you know they're always saying hi to people people are asking for directions and you know you kind of engage in a bit of banter and that that sense of community is fabulous and um, like you know and that's inherent and I was chatting earlier about um, the, when we designed our neighbourhoods is a, has a major part to play in that. Okay, yeah, yeah whether yeah. it was in times of like feast or famine sort of thing in terms of you know, economic stuff? Car, or, car, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah. pre-1940 when it, um, everybody, like very few cars, everybody had to walk or cycle or, you know, take a bus or, uh -huh. you know, so that it was, everything was designed at a scale that, you know, you could walk and cycle and you're much more likely to know your neighbours. Um, and you know roads were narrower so you didn't have a lot of fast traffic going through a neighborhood but then as we went into the 60s and like 60s to 80s um there was an assumption that you know people more people had to have more space for cars so less more people had them we needed to have more space for them so roads became wider people wanted to move out into the kind of more suburban areas so they needed that bit more space but then in the 1990s and unfortunately when we built most of our houses in the boom it was a presumption that everyone had a car so we had to design around making space for those cars but there was no not much consideration given for those that walked or cycled in the design then because it was like sure everyone has a car we don't have to think about that yeah you, know? you end up with the dislocated community completely yeah. completely so now the way they're kind of like trying to row back i mean there's a big thing happening in rath mines at the moment through there was a public consultation and you're probably at the it, bus you? connects yeah the bus yeah. connects thing yeah. and uh, there's a lot of conflict in communities about that because mm -hmm. i mean it's it's designed to be improving urban connectivity right yeah but a lot of people who are cyclists or you know who, who would be urban transport uh, urban commuters are really against that development so can you describe a little bit of like what the tensions are and, and whether you what your thoughts are on that i can't figure this would come up <laughs> couldn't resist couldn't too resist really, too, too topical yeah. yeah no it is it is really topical and um communication has a key piece to play in this mm. right um and um, that's something I'm really trying to do. So I, I mainly teach civil engineers and um, trying to communicate with them, like how do we talk to others? And like, we're nerdy by nature as engineers. And, you know, we, you know, we love our numbers and our stats. And, you know, uh, we're not like, we now are trying to teach the, or the, the engineers to communicate better. And so that they, when they go into a scenario, when they have to present a technical design, that they're better able to communicate that. Anyway, so that's an aside, but it has, it has it, it, but it is relevant. Um, so, bus connects right. So the, the 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 idea behind it is that we actually need to have a full redesign of our bus network because there's too many places where the buses slow down so much that they can't deliver. People are not using the buses because trips are taking too long. What they should do. Okay. Um, so we have a hierarchy where it's walking first in our street design hierarchy that's okay. walking first then cycling 
then public transport, and then the private car. But you would be excused to think that we actually do the other, other way around. <laughs> and is that just you know? within a certain proximity to the city centre, or does that continue out in the suburbs? Um, in urban, ar in urban, urban areas, for absolute definite. Okay. And then yeah. after that, it's context. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the suburban, if it's predominantly residential, yes, that still applies. Okay, yeah. You know, and okay. even in, in like rural villages at a crossroads where there are collective houses, you should do that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. No, it is, and it, it, it very contextual. Design is really contextual. Okay. Um, so, Sorry. no, you're fine. The, so, so on the bus connects, we need to be able to move more people quicker on bus through the city. Okay. It is the cheapest way to do it. Like, like, and the th problem with metro, people love, like, love people love rail. Right, people are more comfortable in rail, but rail just goes from one place to another, direct line, and you're only servicing the people along that route. Okay. Right, you're you're increasing the values of all the land along that route, but you're also isolating other people from it. We know people walk further to get to rail because it's more predictable. So if we can make our bus more predictable okay. and more reliable, we should be able to catch more people right across the city. Um, on our bus network. Are there other cities that are doing this that we're modeling it on? Or are we kind of like just forging ahead into a total unknown? Uh, I mean, not total unknown, but like yeah, you know, it's something no. that's untemplated. It is templated in different ways. So basically the whole idea of having a network where everybody can get to anywhere in the city in a reasonable amount of time is the fundamental of any transport system, urban transport system. Some cities will have more money and a higher density to justify doing a full underground. Okay. We don't have the densities to justify that. Is we that do in is? some places. Yes, it okay. is. Yeah. I thought yeah. it was about the Victorian pipe network underground. There was all sorts of like talk about the different... Well, that that, that does contribute to okay. the cost. But it's basically the, the, the amount of people per, per mile. Per Model, yeah, know. and with Lewis, for example, like the majority of the costs around Lewis was actually the infill of the basements and the archaeological work and the, the like, what the unknowns. And so people okay. are going, well, you said it was only going to cost so many million and it cost so much more, but that's because you don't know what's there, you know, yeah. when you when you go digging. Um, so like when we when we so the Harcourt line, the way we, we were able to use an existing rail line, that was much cheaper because there wasn't as much digging. Like yeah. Getting to the city centre, okay. it was more expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yes, that is a factor. There's so many factors. But the idea is that we want a system that any, anyone from any community can access a high frequency bus that's going to take them to where they want to go. Mm. We have designed, up to now, our bus system all goes into the city centre. Mm. Because most jobs were in the city centre. Now we have an awful lot of people that are travelling to work suburb to suburb mm. and we don't have a public transport system that facilitates them. Yeah, yeah the rush hour is a lot less predictable in cars. You're like, oh hi, but I'm going away from the traffic. You're like, yeah. no, no, you're not going away from the traffic anymore. It's much more like yeah. cross flow. It's everywhere. Kind yeah. Of, yeah, yeah. And the M50, which yes. was never intended as a commuter route. That was a relief road to, to keep the trucks out and to keep... That was to move yeah. people on the outside oh, is wow. now a commuter route. Wow. Yeah, it's the main commuter. It's the main commuter route, and it's <laughs> completely unpredictable. Okay. And when you're on it, you're stuck on it. Yeah. You know, yeah, if yeah. something goes wrong, you're stuck there. Whereas oh. if you come through the city, and there's more and more people travelling through the city mm. because like of the unpredictability. Uh, it, uh, these are all things we have to deal with in what we design. Yeah. So coming back, so this stage of bus connects is about identifying the routes okay. and actually going. Consultation and it is the big public consultation that has happened around any piece of infrastructure. Wow. And they have had over 30,000 um, submissions. It has to feel through those. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they, and, and it's only because there's like, um, uh, yeah, so you, you have, the, and the way they approached it is Jarrett Walker, the, um, the consultant that they brought in from abroad, and so he has done this in other cities. Some have worked and some haven't, but there's lessons learned in all of those, and sure. you know, it all does feed forward. So just Say it didn't it didn't work in Wellington, and I spoke to the mayor who was involved in it at the time, and she said, "Yeah, it didn't really work for us, but there's lessons learned from that." Okay. Um, As Wellington, a similar comparable kind of city size and stuff, it, does it does it have a lot of? It would be, you know, if, if I remember correctly, it's a little bit smaller. Um, it does have the narrow streets. Yeah, that's the yeah. Thing. Is so that, is that the biggest are... trick, kind of, to getting it right, because I mean, that's the thing that people seem to be shouting about in my area in Rathmines anyway, the, yeah. the widening of that and the robbing of people's front gardens and you know, that sort of stuff in terms of how that affects the... And it's a, it's a balance. And, and so the communication piece really, I suppose, around at this point of the public consultation is that um, the initial drawings were done, they're engineering drawings, right? Yeah. So you had to put something out to talk about. But when people saw engineering drawings, they assumed it was the final, okay. this is the final design, which it actually isn't. It was, this is, this is what we want to talk about. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, Jarrett Walker actually brought in all the like the um, 
public representatives into a room before ever anything started and goes, this is what it's about and this is what it is for. And he's like, he told me himself, he had the buy-in of people. Okay, great. You know, but when it went out to the communities and with local elections coming up and community groups were starting to kick up, people jump ship. Nobody wanted to stand up for Nobody it. wanted to stand up for it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. Okay. Um, but I get what you're saying. Like at the moment, we need the wider roads and like, again, like the initial designs are mainly engineer driven, but there are a mixed, mixed team on it. But, you know, to get the bus routes in and to consider, continue to consider the car and, and the cyclists, because we want a cycling city. We have a perfect city for cycling. We just need to actually provide better, safer infrastructure because we have so many people that will cycle but they're the people that are willing to take that risk and are comfortable. But if we want to ramp up those numbers, we need more segregated paths and we need a safer environment for that. I would definitely concur with that. That was yeah. in my head, times three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I will cycle around certain parts of the city and others I won't. I got knocked off my bike and I find it really difficult to actually bring myself back to it. without holding my breath the whole way going. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you want to be relaxed, that's the thing. It's a, I mean, it's a huge yeah. factor. If you're, if you're making people, or funneling people into a stressful commuting environment. We know that the urban kind of landscape has too many stimulants already. Yes. That people are stressed from, you know, when mm -hmm. they leave their house to when they come back in and often still when they come back in, unfortunately, and yeah. before they leave, depending on how many children they've had and whatever else has gone on in their lives. Yeah. And so to try to reduce that stimulus, is, is that a big part of it? Is that like to try and kind of like calm the yeah. commuter? Yeah. Uh, how, yeah how much do they think about that? Like, I mean, apart from the cyclists, is it, like, can you do that within bus as well? Yes, and, and that that the things that will stress people on their commute are the like, will I get there on time? Yeah, okay. Am I going to be packed in on a bus where and uh, you know like people are coughing and sneezing on me and people get worried about that? But if we have more frequent buses, you're going to get more people, more space on the bus. You're not all crammed on the one because there hasn't been one for twenty minutes. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, an efficient system will yeah. kind of negate most of those things. But people remember the negative. Yeah. And you have to work your way around that and get past that. Yeah. It's one of those little human instincts, isn't it? And how does it feel like as a country girl building a, a city's architecture? Do you feel like you've got a like an, an aspect on this where you're kind of trying to work people towards, you know, like, I, like, I, you're saying like a little bit of you is still kind of lost in the country that, hello, <laughs> <laughs> you can't be seen. No, you can't. Great. No. Um, <laughs> but uh, do, do you have like a struggle with that when you're kind of like just feeding more people into this already kind of like clogged atmosphere? Like, do you not just want to like say, well, we'll just build a town for you down there? Um, well, town, that's important, okay. right? Because where I'm from, um, the ideal is this one-off house in the countryside, yeah. which is very isolating because these people are sitting and, and this ideal that you live in the countryside with this community and you're out in the green and you're like you know you're soaking up the environment and i'll talk about restorative environments and nature in a while yes, please. and uh, yeah these um you have this ideal of what it's going to be like but the reality is that you're sitting into your car every morning and you're dropping your kids if you have kids somewhere but you're driving to work you have a longer commute to get to where you're going you mightn't be sitting in traffic which might be a decision that you've made yeah. um but you're longer in the car and um, you go to your workplace and then you come home back in your car to your home and you may not interact with anybody in that time. In that time. Or if you're working from home, you might not interact with anybody. And so socializing people a little bit. You, yeah, it is. It be, and it was different before when farmers were living in these one-off houses rurally because they were still having to go into the mart and mm. into the shop. Whereas now people are going to the shops elsewhere on, when, the, when they're in town yeah. or you know, in work or whatever. They're not shopping in their local shops. Sure. And this, the village is the village is core to what I preach, right? Because mm -hmm. it is where we can justify services, where people have the interactions and the sociality. So we want people who you can have that rural living, but be close to a village. It's and it, and and that village thing, because where my mom lives is, I guess it's kind of a hamlet. But okay. that, that would have been where I grew up from when I was around fourteen. And you know, it's it's one road yeah. essentially with kind of houses, office, and the, there was a pub and a post office and a shop and a community centre. Um, and then, so when we were growing up, we'd walk down our little laneway and we'd go to the shop in the morning, we'd get the papers and we'd talk to the lady and she'd tell us like what had happened. Yeah. You know, such and such has had some new chicks and you can go pop around there and see the new chicks. And you know, the farmer down there has had lambs that have been born or my yeah. brother, I was telling you, used to make like homemade truffles and sell them for money, yeah. for pocket money. And, yeah, yeah. Shop. and that was really nice. And then it closed down. Yeah. And the post office closed down mm -hmm. and the village hall started getting used for like dances once a month 
and all of the people who lived in our hamlet became isolated and especially yeah. the older people because before you knew that Joyce lived in this house and she did the sewing and you could go and take your jumper down to her and you'd have a little chat and you'd go home but there was no reason to go there because everyone just went to Tesco's or to Sainsbury's mm -hmm. or whatever it was down the road and there was no bus routes yeah. so it was very much you go in your own car and if you don't have a car you're stuck there. What's weird is how nostalgic this sounds and how recent it is like that yeah. adjustment has been so fast. So yeah. fast. I mean the people who were like our age are remembering nostalgically people who are like 60 years older who are still still around they're like Arr. i mean at least we're kind of like at an age where maybe there's a bit more ability to adapt to a, a new a new kind of way of doing yeah. things yeah. not necessarily a healthier way i, I, I think the hamlet thing is, is a much nicer idea and every time we go on holidays it's kind of like the best bit is like wandering into the village like be, like yeah. with you know and, and, mm. and interacting with all the people in there sitting down having a coffee watching life go by and all that sort of fun stuff but it's weird that that's like that's an escape from real life now yeah because you have to go to like to the holodeck to even like to, oh no okay we're about to i feel we're about to have like people actually using the skate park <laughs> yeah. for. we might get our knees cut off um, but it's really interesting what you said about closing down the post office mm. right because this is an, another one of my big gripes i'm getting them all in today um <laughs> Like, the, like on post as when it was um, when it was like a national entity and a, like a like a, a government. Like I can't think the word is like I'm getting distracted now. <laughs> the, yeah. But when it was government, only, like you know, we had the post office in every village. It was a public service, right? Um, that was an, a very important part. It was not just about post. Yeah. It was a congregation. It was a place to congregate because all the older people were there on pension day, and you know, yeah, 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 there yeah. was like and ch children's allowance day. All the parents were there, and it was an opportunity to interact. And when you went in and you got your pension, you you popped into the other shops. You went and you met your friend for coffee in the local shop. And banks the same. The, the, like the, there was there was a, interactions in the community and community building happened around these places. And um, then you know privatized or the big banks kind of like moved out of these villages and they say oh well it's better for everybody it's cost low and all the rest of it. But they're taking out those inter incidental um, trips into towns and you hear of villages when the post office goes the butcher goes yeah. because you know people now go into the big supermarket instead. And it's really sad, and I feel really angry yeah. at, on, like in, in particular, the post offices and the banks, because their social responsibility was way more than the provision of a postal service. Do you think they didn't realise it? I okay. think when it got privatised and it became about the profit Just and money, I doubt they, they forgot about it. I don't think it was. Yeah, and it should have been. Yeah, that's yeah. such a shame, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's like it's difficult to have like modern, modern lives. I mean, people are starting to work from home, and there's this there's this thing you see a lot of people aspiring towards who are in maybe the millennial generation, maybe our generation as well. We're on the edge of millennials. Sorry, we're still millennials. Apologies. Um, are you, I'm you're, not. Millennials? <laughs> you're close. You no. must be. Um, but anyway, let's not get into that. But, <laughs> but uh, so you see them aspiring to kind of like work from wherever you want to be yes. and working from home and not necessarily needing a commute, not needing a like any interactions in their day. How do you? plan for those people to socialize in a, in a in a culture like what 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 do you do for them yeah it's like and, and it is that that community place that holds things that they can interact with yeah 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 and um Again, coming back to that WhatsApp group, and this is just something because I, I admin a WhatsApp group, and I don't, it's not, it's not even admin, I add people to it, you know, <laughs> um, that out around where, I, where I'm living, and the um, new people to the neighborhood, you know, moments ago, oh, you're on the WhatsApp group, and incidentally, then there's a meet up here, or like, you know, nice. anyone wants to talk about clan pot nappies, like, or something, you know, yeah. a group will come together, and it kind of it brings that kind of millennial culture of like you know I'm all about my online and my independence, mm. but I do want to be part of something. Yeah. And like you know, so that kind of facility brings you back to. Yeah. So it's about having a community of people that you identify with or that you're comfortable with yeah, yeah, yeah. within that that structure. And this village is applicable to every context like so an urban context or a rural context and um, I did a series of focus groups as part of my PhD work and someone actually it was it, he was brilliant but he just he just goes but sure it's just like Greenwich Village and Soho like there are really heavily dense places with loads of people but you probably interact with the same 30 to 40 people because you go yeah. to the same shops yeah. so you're in this place that everyone but you you have your village within it and it's the same in that rural village or in any urban context there's kind of an optionality to it or whatever and yeah. that planning allows for that village feel 
whether you're in this densely populated urban environment or whether it's a village village. Yeah. yeah. And that's what we need to retrofit our suburbia for. Mm. We need to bring that and how we like it, it's complex. It's not easy. It's really difficult to retrofit anything. But to try and people are afraid of change yeah. and they're like going, oh, you're trying to bring people into our neighborhood that we're we're happy to, you know, works, yeah, 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 people choose to live in suburbia for different reasons that people choose to live in urban urban setting yeah. and personality driven driven. And, you know, when you're living in suburbia, you probably like having your defensible space and, you know, that I kind of, uh, you know, I fit everyone else. We all have the same house, you yeah. know, we yeah. all have similar cars here. Yeah. I, this is I feel like I belong here, whereas in an urban space, you know, everyone's different and some people feel more comfortable in that different urban space. Yeah, so like, I mean, there's a little bit where you're driving people in a certain direction that you want to encourage them towards, and there's a little bit where you're allowing for people's differences. But aren't there just elements of suburbia now? Okay, I'm going to speak from a person who likes okay. urban environment. Here we go. But yeah. I also like, you know, lived down farm and done different things. But essentially, I like that idea that people have different, you know, pay grades, like fronts of houses, all that sort of like washing on the line, mm -hmm. like that sort of thing. For me, I find that interesting yeah. is it not the case that there is a necessary loss of socialization people go to suburbia like it can you like i know you're saying you're with the whatsapp group mm. but that's having to kind of like reverse engineer it a little yeah. bit isn't it yeah it is it is reverse engineering it and people living in suburbia again it's it's that sitting into the car and you know driving somewhere and interestingly there's um an economist in he's based in new york chris leinberger and he um I think he put it really well. He kind of he associated with fashion, like and and right. what's popular culture. Yeah, yeah. That in the 1960s, I love Lucy. Like you know, everybody yeah. wanted to live that idealist suburban life, you yeah. know. And for our parents' generation, like you know, urban life was about like you know, uh, Coronation Street and you know places where lots of crime happened in urban yeah. areas. Someone yeah, yeah. gets murdered every second week. So why would you want to live mm. in somewhere like Coronation Street? Um, but then our generation had like Seinfeld and um, friends and who idealized urban life yeah. so that there was like the TV programs that we watched kind of informed the type of places we wanted to towards. live. That's yeah. interesting. And also the people who are probably building our environment now, I mean not you, but they tend to be of a generation where they're coming still from that thing of running away from the crime in urban yeah. environments. So, um, or they may have grown up in one of those suburban areas that's their ideal because we, i'm talking about how my ideal is the countryside and, but I, i've moved to the urban but like that's i still have this romantic picture of it but their norm was being driven to school every day yeah. and living in the suburban environment and it was positive for them because that's what they know and we now have a generation of of, of the our current generation of parents are most likely to have been driven to school themselves Okay, so if you're talking about in playground design, you have mm. to build in risk, then surely you should be doing exactly the same thing to adults in terms of our environment as well. And mm -hmm. what we're not kind of allowed to, once people get beyond 18, they can choose their own gig, right? Yeah, yeah. So how do you do that? How do you how do you put risk into adult environments that, that inc or encourage that, that risk so that people will break those boundaries even if they didn't have them as a kid? Subtly so they don't see it as a risk for starters. <laughs> Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. But it so is... no it, it, the it, pavement. It, but it's parks like this. <laughs> yeah. It's parks like this where, the, you know, everybody has a place and a belonging and and also what's really important about the way that the, the entrance into this, that it's wide, mm. that um, there was, a, it was a, a case study in, um, it was over in the UK and there was older people saying that they didn't like the park, it wasn't safe for them, but it was a lovely park in sight in it. And like, you know, when they went to speak to them, they were like, why? Like, what is it? And they were like, it was actually the entrance was quite narrow. Oh, and yeah. there was a group of kids who used to congregate oh, just yeah, inside the gate. Interesting. That was the barrier. So what they did is they opened up the, the gate wider to be like this and they to put two big bollards at either side. So the kids actually just set up on that. So they were back wow. from the space and yeah, it increased usage. That's cool. Yeah, and it, it's simple things like this. And there's another example, it's out actually out in Knock Line where um, there was no break in the wall. There was a, a long wall and people were constantly hopping it and lifting their bikes over it. But for older people or people with buggies or people yeah, in they wheelchairs, don't. they couldn't. And opening up that gap now, I think it was 1,500 people, I think, the, like, the NTA worked this out when, when they funded the scheme to open it up. I think it was 1,500 people were now within walking distance of Knockline Village because of that. 1,500 extra people. 1,500 extra people. That's just huge. And that was simply just breaking a hole in the wall. But people are so scared of breaking holes. And, um, you know, where there's, big, there's another example, another, like, I, another example I love is just outside Blanchardstown Shopping Centre on the Sugborough Road. 
there's just this big long wall like blocking all this massive residential area from the shopping centre. And there's a shopping trolley that's nearly always there. At the, like it goes, comes back, and like what? another shopping trolley's got. Interesting. The people used to jump the wall. Oh right. Well, right? So you can actually see where, like on like um, on the pillars, you can see there's piece, bits with no no moss and it's worn for where they get the leg up off the trolley over the wall. <laughs> Nobody complains about that. Like you know, like people are they know these it's an accepted, it's accepted like thing. But when someone suggested breaking a hole there so everybody could walk through, the community didn't want it at all. Because they have a fear of strange stranger danger and and the reality is it's actually safer. The more people you have walking through your neighborhood, the safer yeah, yeah, it yeah, actually yeah, is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um there's more eyes on the street and and more social interaction. But people fear it. People fear change. And that's what I mean. That's the kind of retrofitting that's really difficult to do. Sure. I think it's hard though as well, because when you're talking about risk, like we applaud risk takers when it works out well for them. Uh, yeah. But when risk takers take a risk and it doesn't work out, everyone points fingers yeah, and says, well, yeah. if Very they true. didn't take that risk. And that's really hard. I mean, as a parent, certainly, like I would have grown up in the countryside. We were playing outside all day long, like you said, we were left. I mean, and a lot of mine was in the mountains, in the fall. You know, we were running around and there were yeah. snakes and there was all sorts of things and nothing happened to us, we were fine. But now I live in an estate, there's a big green area outside of my house, so do the kids play there, my son's four and a half. I wouldn't dream of letting him play out there on his own. I mean, there's cars going around and, and so that's the different thing. But I know that if I let him out there and he was fine, everyone would be great with it until he got yeah. stolen by a stranger or he got hit by a car and then everyone would be like, you're a completely irresponsible parent. So how do you find that balance of encouraging risk and letting people know that fear and risk is more beneficial than, you know, it's, it's kind of a shift in our whole way that we approach everything, though, isn't it? We just applaud the successes and then when there's failures, we look at failure as bad as I'm, opposed to a learning experience. And I think we all understand at some level, because well, you see it enough on Instagram, that like, you know, living a life based in love where you're open to change, open to possibility is always, you know, that better to have loved and lost than have never loved as well. Everybody knows that and everybody agrees. I don't know. Nobody shakes your head when they say that. But, yeah. But by the same token, we don't apply that to our lives as we get. We, I mean, it's like everyone moves from being liberal to being conservative as they grow old. And fortunately, it's that protective <laughs> mechanism. It's really difficult to break that down, isn't it? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And I guess that's, and that's the transition from urban to rural, or urban to suburban, mm. kind of needing a little bit more, like, physical space around you and head space or what what is that but it's habits and norms yeah i guess it's so. habits and norms and normalization of the environment and people telling you that you know when you get a good job you you buy a three bed semi semi d out okay, in suburbia yeah, yeah, and yeah. If, and if that's, that's the, the norm and that's what if that's what if that's what your friends are doing you know you they think you're nuts if you decide to you know do up an old house in here you know yeah, they, yeah, yeah. and People just don't like people don't like standing out, you know, or unless they are the person that really wants to stand out. And it's it, like, yeah, we, and I, I keep coming back to the subtlety, like you know, that we just have to think about it in our design. We just have to consider when we design things, think about all users, all spaces, but not try too hard. Yeah. If we do a big welcome, you know, come join us, people also fear that. Yeah. They're like, well, <laughs> yeah, it's way too why much. are you bringing me in here? But it's <laughs> something that you will like curiosity and and um. In urban design, like you know, it's, it's they talk about it as an invitation, an invitation to continue through. So something that will get grab your attention in the distance that will make you want to keep walking that direction. And the more we do that, we more we increase people's spatial geography. So people will can they move around the space that they're comfortable with, and something will change. Uh, where you have to go to like you know a child might go from primary school to secondary school, for example, or a new workplace, and it'll take you to another direction and and and. You know, intervening at that point with an individual and helping them make decisions around their public transport use or how are you going to travel to work, even walking, cycling. And if you can get that person at that time, it, that's the time when we can actually influence change. Whereas, you know, they think, oh, well, I have to drive there where it is without kind of having an informed discussion around the options. Yes. You know, anyway, but, but you're also increasing that spatial geography to another space. And people, so there was this, um, this, this, um, uh, program intervention that was done in in the UK called Beat the Street, and it was done here as well. And for some some reasons, it didn't work so well, and others it worked really well. What it um, what it was was a little card, a little tap card, and it was around the vicinity of schools. And basically, the kids had to go around and tap the card in these. So we were getting them to walk a distance, and it became yeah. a little competition. So they had an international competition between different cities. Okay. But one of the things that they found great, they, and they used to move the boxes as well. 
and then it all you know so you couldn't drive between them or you'd be cut out the okay. time like, yeah, yeah, they yeah, worked yeah. out times and whatever wow. but one of the fi- one of the real pluses with it was that they found the, the feedback from the parents afterwards is that they actually kids got to know where their friends lived they were walking different roads and yeah. they were comfortable with those roads and knew where their friends were so parents were reporting they were much more likely to let their child walk to their friend's house cool. because they had, they had, ex- idea, they had a, the idea of space geography and it was familiarization of that space nice. so it's li- there was all these little subtle things that we can do to try and encourage that yeah. and what do you, sorry, nature walks for example from school go for walks around school and walking yeah. buses and all of yeah, these things walking. help yeah they help. And do you think that health we were talking a little bit about this earlier but do you think health is a drive that people listen to you know if you're giving them the idea that not just for socialization but for their health it is good to walk or it is good to cycle it is good to explore their environment do you think that's something that people listen to largely so it how the message is framed is important <laughs> yeah because it's, it's like anything it's a, it's that kind of if a message is too familiar you have to change it up mm. and people know walking and cycling are good for them um, but you know, even if they know it, if it's difficult to do or difficult to make that change for whatever different reason, you, you could have just be really busy and have so much going on that actually you know that you should be walking cycling more, but you just can't picture it because there's so much going on. And they actually, this is something they're finding around smoking cessation, that they actually, when they go into lower deprived neighborhoods where they're finding the, 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 the least amount of people making the change, they're finding that these people are just so overwhelmed with personal debt or other problems at home that they just can't get their head around another thing. Another yeah. thing. So, um, uh, so yeah. Where was I going with this? <laughs> they, so health, the message. So health, around health. So um, physical inactivity, right? Um, so this is not, uh, you know, in t- partaking in activity that raises your heart rate for, you know, so it's, it's really just kind of brisk walking or, you know, anything that just raises your heart rate. It makes you just a little bit clammy, but not necessarily sweaty. We should be engaging in 30 minutes, five times a week. 30? 30 minutes, minutes five, five times a week. Times and every, yeah, every... <laughs> I can't remember that. But walking where, you're, when you're walking and talking where you have to kind of go, <gasps> just a little yeah. bit when you're talking yeah, yeah, while you yeah. walk. You know, it's not, it's not going to the gym and pounding it out. It's just, a, it's gardening, it's yeah. housework. It's, so every bout of 10 minutes or more counts towards that, right? So, yeah. And even studies are finding now that even less is still beneficial. Mm. There's, that's our point at which we say someone is physically active if they engage in that. Only one third of Irish adults meet that requirement, right? And for children, it should be 60 minutes a day, every day a week. And I can't think of it off hand what the actual stat is, but it's atrocious. I think it's less than half are, are, are meeting okay. that, right? Yeah. But, so sorry, less than half of kids, and kids. less than 30% of adults. Yeah, so it's a third yeah, of adults. Yeah, yeah, are meeting yeah. that, right? Um, Physical, like so, 14% of the burden of uh, like so premature mortality, right? So anything bar old age for that really, this um, 14% of it can be attributed to physical inactivity. That's how heavy this is as a burden of disease, right? Um, like road traffic accidents, only 0.5. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. And how much money do we spend? How on much money do we spend on that? Exactly. Mm. Um, and now, and like our road design, a lot of it has to do, and there's subtleties in road design where we're making it safer for cars to try and reduce, um, you know, road fatalities from accidents that are actually deterring people from walking or cycling. Oh, so, interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah. So when um, people see uh, road traffic accidents, they kind of go, oh, well, that's not a safe space, so I'm going to take the car when I go there? As opposed yeah. to, or what, is that no, no, is actually, um, barriers, right? Okay, so okay, so yeah, bar- yeah. like yeah. this is one example, is barriers along the side of the road, okay. which stop people from crossing. Now, that if you're putting barriers up, it means that you haven't designed the area for people's desire line where they need to and want to cross, because okay. they're going to take the risk to cross elsewhere. Yeah. And... Um, but, but, all over Cork Street, actually. Oh, oh yeah. There's yeah. crazy barriers. I mean, you have to, when you want to cross over one of the, the crossroads down here, there's like 20 feet of barriers around every corner yeah. for pedestrians. Yeah. So yeah, like that's that's not designing around enough yeah. around what people's des- desire line is the term. Desire so where they want to actually cross. So okay. people will hop those. They're yeah, more yeah. likely to get knocked down because the car is not expecting it because Absolutely. there's a barrier there. Uh-huh. Um, and actually Kensington High Street in London when they did a redesign and Broadway in New York they found massive like massive reductions in the amount of incidents where people pedestrians were being hit when they took away the barriers wow. right because That's it was weird, more of it yeah because it was more personal responsibility as well isn't it a little bit but also people it comes back to risk yeah. that if people perceive there to be there's a chance that somebody's going to come out and even like when you're driving through in a housing state when they see kids out playing yeah. you're much more aware of the potential for there to be a child that runs out in front of you uh-huh. than 
uh, like somewhere where the kids aren't playing, uh. right? When there could be as equally a chance of it, right? <laughs> um, so that's another, like, you know, if you can design, have spaces where people will be out playing because they're overlooked and people feel safe. And like, cul-de-sacs can be good and bad for this. We, we want permeability, which is the ease of movement through a whole neighborhood. Uh, but we don't want too much car permeability because it increases the traffic. Sure. But then if people perceive it to be a quite space wide road, they're going to travel faster. So we have nuances in how we design the streets to slow down. And this is why the... So, um, like the quiet way that was uh, um, pr um, proposed, so, so right across South Dublin, um, was such, a, for, in my opinion, it was such a great idea because it actually allowed for that filtered permeability, as we call it. Pedestrians and cyclists can move through these areas, but the cars can't. So, car owners objected to it because they were saying we're going to be stuck in traffic. Now, we have a, there is also a phenomenon called traffic evaporation because what we find is when we actually, when we restrict tra traffic, for a while traffic will get worse, people will get worse, but it, they'll make the change okay, yeah, into yeah, yeah. the public transport, or they'll change their route, and cars do literally disappear. Do you see many people moving from their own car, moving to work, to, to going on to buses? Does that actually happen? It happens with rail because people perceive, perceive yeah. rail to be that comfortable, safe, and, and the, one of the aims of Bus Connect is to provide that service on bus. Okay. At the moment, bus doesn't really provide that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so funny, we, we want to provide that. Mm. Um, I think a massive thing when I was taking the bus, like my work is impossible. I, it's almost impossible. I, it is actually impossible for me to do my work without using the car. Yeah. Like I was driving from one place to another place to another place, and I mm. couldn't get there in the time, and I also go out the bus route. So yeah. Thing. But when I used to take the bus, a huge deterrent was that loads of the buses didn't have bus shelters on them. And oh, yes. And invariably in this country, just get soaked. Yep. And you're going, well, I'm not, I don't want to get soaked on my way into town because then I'll just be wet and I'm going to spend all day walking around wet. So then yep. I'll just take the car. And that's a massive yep. thing. You know, and those things are subtle. And, it, and, and, and little pieces of information like that, like, and this is why the type of qualitative work that some of my colleagues and I do um, is really important because we, you, you don't know that they are the barriers until you actually go out and speak to these people. Sure. And there's actually an architecture student, I only heard about it yesterday, he's one of our architecture students, I say, or I'm not in the School of Architecture, but in the College of the Built Environment in TU Dublin, um, has actually brought that up as an issue and is now looking at, at bus stop design and the orientation of bus stops and where the wind and rain is because if you use the they're always on the side of the road in the same design but you can be right in a wind yeah. and rain tunnel yeah, totally. um, but they're actually looking at this yeah Good. yeah yeah so and it, it is it's, it's talk it's, it's identifying the subtleties and small things and yeah. what can we do and they all contribute yeah. Yeah. and to, what's kind of nice about that is i remember being somewhere where the bus um coverage is for like a big um kind of like a semicircle, like a hood, mm. but kind of round. There's an inclusivity to that as well, because yeah. it funnels everyone into that one space, and then you're all waiting for the bus, and instead of that being this boring thing where you're like, okay, 10 minutes till that bus comes, yeah. you're not gonna do that. You have the chat to the neighbor and the person, and when you get on, you share the seat, or you give the seat, or you talk, and you don't yeah. mind then, you're not going, oh, that person's gonna give me the flu. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, nice yeah, person yeah. that I just spoke to a few minutes. And I actually think this is funny, around, I, I've been kind of observing this, I haven't done any research on it, but observing um, the role of real time in information like first of all we have more people using the buses because of the predictability particularly the low frequency routes like the 17 and other routes like I'm very conscious that I'm talking all South Dublin here but like those routes that you never knew it could be once an hour you never knew if it was going to turn up so whereas now you have the app to tell you oh it is going to be coming I will use it but the um at the amount of times I'd be at a stop where they don't have the display and I take out my mobile to check when the next bus is and, and an older person that probably doesn't Just use no a mobile so, so how long to the when's next one, when's it coming? <laughs> and you can start a conversation. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. and even though you see loads of people at the bus stops not talking to each other because they're all mm. on the phone, I wonder, would they be talking to each other anyway? Was, yeah. Or is actually the real time a facilitator for conversation? Yeah. Or not? Yeah. So, I, not all technology is bad. So it's yeah. like, you know, it's hard to, hard to know. It'd be yeah. fun if you like made a bus stop. So like the first person who got the bus stop was the only person who got that information they were required to share with everyone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You're 117, can I remember? That was 915, you were 63. <laughs> Hang on, let me remember again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great for socialization, it's probably a bit painful in terms of... Yeah, know, you, know, would, you would be hanging back not to be the first yeah, person exactly. to arrive at the yeah. stop. <laughs> the responsibility, the burden of responsibility would be too much. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is accessibility though, isn't it? But especially with buses, you know, if you're a mum with a buggy or if you're a wheelchair user. Yeah. Certainly when I was using the bus, it wasn't every bus that could no. accommodate you. And that's massively awkward, obviously. 
Whenever I used to get on with my, my kids in the sling, like the bus drivers, like, that yoke is great. They love seeing mums with the slings. Like they really did. But, yeah. <laughs> do you know, but like, but I, I, I was, you know, it, it's something that did occur to me. I was like, oh, maybe there should be a promotion piece around that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, they're you getting out reflective vests as cyclists. Why not? Oh, yeah. Don't start me on the reflective vests. Okay, go on. Yeah, yeah. I will start you on the reflective vests. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, again, it's this, this whole um, risk and who is the burden being put on. Okay. And like, if you're putting a requirement on people to wear helmets, to wear high vis, you are telling the pedestrian going, or the cyclist, and, and you know, yeah, the kids all wearing their high vises. Like, you know, the driver, their perception is that, oh, sure, every um, child is going to have a high vis on, so I only have to look out for high vis, not I have to be aware of everything in this yeah, space. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're putting that burden on. You're telling, even though our hierarchy says we are prioritizing walkers and, cy walkers and cyclists, we're telling them, well, actually you know we want you to take the responsibility for your safety rather than our design wow. taking responsibility for I'd that i think you might make yourself a bit of a social pariah having that uh, attitude in a bunch of school parents am i wrong is it is it like what's the predominant opinion is it, i there... have no idea my kids aren't in school yet okay <laughs> <laughs> next year next have year a chat with lorraine when she's here when she's here with no reflective vest yeah. but it, it's the it's the um just even that recent program that was done on cycling um now you see me i don't know if you saw it on rte oh, yeah, it was really good have a have a look at it um and i'm assuming that the aim of it was to kind of normalize um just to kind of i suppose normalize um to address people's perceptions as drivers and cyclists this this like and they're they're always pitched against each other in the media which know, is like really person, frustrating yeah. like and a lot of cyclists are also drivers and and you know not as many vice versa but um like i'm both you know so there's this this thing where you know they're they're pitching them up as enemies of each other in the competition whereas the the role of this um, program was to kind of just get a conversation going around it but it was sponsored by the rsa and in every image, the cyclists were wearing their high vises and their um, and their helmets. And even when it was um, Blonda Tracy, I think it was, was um, the presenter, when she was overseas, like she was going around Europe, she was wearing her high vis and her helmet, and nobody else around her was wearing it. That's you know? interesting. Whoopsie. Like yeah. <laughs> so 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 other European cities where cycling is a big uh, a big thing, they yeah. don't endorse that in the same way. They don't need to because they yeah. prioritize. They prioritise having secretive spaces and okay. they prioritise the cyclists. They put them ahead of the driver okay. and they pro they provide the environment for the cyclist okay. and oh, ahead of the car. Sure you just, just to be the devil's advocate Go on. Uh, the high vis thing is one thing, but the helmet is a different thing because you can just be a bad cyclist and then park your head Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah no. So, like, a helmet is, is kind of a... I feel like that's a separate thing. Because I wear a pink helmet. Yeah. It's like you looking yeah. after yourself. I wear a pink helmet, yeah. and re the reason being, um, there's, there was a study done. Um, uh, it, this guy went out with uh, he put a sensor. This, this is quite a while ago, and I'm not sure if it's been replicated. He put his, um, a sensor on his bike to measure the distance of the cars passing him, right? And so he was out in his like full lycra and you know high vis, and the cars travelled faster and closer, mm. fast and close to him. Then when he like, was in his like work suit or work clothes without a helmet, they travel a little bit further. When he went out in a wig and a dress, they were even further away again. And this is that <laughs> perception of risk. And so the car is like, so th this is what I mean by the more that you look like um, you're like prepared, you, you, they, they can take that risk of being closer to you because you have your kitted out in the safety gear. Fantastic. It's how the driver, the, the driver of the car perceive you. So they were saying women are the worst cyclists. The perception was. Yeah. They were much more likely to. That's kind of depressing. Though. So I went in and got bizarre, my pink helmet. It? Shows the perceptions, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so and pink helmet people are now going to travel somewhere in between that because she's got a helmet, but it's a pink one. So they're like, she's like. <laughs> it's it's girly, you know. Yeah, that's weird. That's so and and, it, and Dublin bikes, right? I, I love this about like cycling is so like so fashion and um, this you know this oh I can't cycle so because I you know I'll be all sweaty, my hair will be ruined, I can't wear a helmet, and helmet hair is a genuine concern among teenage girls when it comes to cycling. Um, this, um, you know, it's so easy to cycle in heels compared, like, to walking in heels. So to oh, make right, short yeah, urban yeah, trips, that's, yeah. uh, Dublin bikes is a great thing for it. Like, and I actually overheard someone in the shop say this one day, going, they were returning something. They were like, I can do it on my lunch break now without having to change my shoes because of Dublin bikes. Boom, lovely. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But you Dublin know, bikes has been like about just about the most successful rollout of city bikes in the whole world. So there was some sort of like better than a lot of the 
Like, wasn't it the rollout in like London and Barcelona? Like, it was being much lower in terms of the actual usage statistics. Wasn't it right? Am I right? I'm not sure about usage statistics, but it was one of the first. Okay. Because it was it, 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 it was one of the first, so a lot of them modelled off it. Okay. Yeah. I think Amsterdam they all got stolen, and then they were all worried to get stolen. <laughs> that didn't happen. Yeah, Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm weird. Like, the, this sort of perception. Like, I remember before the Dumbledore, they were like, ah, oh, listen, they'll all be disappeared. They'll all be gone. Like, mm. all in the lippy. They're no. getting used. Oh, they are being used, and and now they're. Among cyclists, there's like you know, people get impatient when people on the bike saying, "Oh, you know, they yeah, they're oh, they're not competent cyclists. They're annoying. They get stuck behind them." But like, isn't it great that they're cycling? And this is something that I came across in Amsterdam as well. I gave a workshop over in Amsterdam, and um, it was just quite interesting. Like, there were so many funny dynamics in, in in it. But there was a few Dutch people that were here. Like, you know, the way we talk about cars here is the way they talk about cyclists in Amsterdam. Yes, it is the ideal, like, you know, or some of the ideals. I think Copenhagen is a much more inclusive design um, kind of approach. But in the city centre, like the cyclists kind of appreciate there's lots of tourists on bikes. Yeah. So they kind of accept that they're going to have. But apparently they they're very, much been there. Yeah, they're very <laughs> intolerant when you go out into the suburbs of slower cyclists. Mm. And, you know, they, they park their bikes and they, sh they were showing me pictures. They park their bikes, bikes all over the footpaths, blocking the pedestrian ways. And the same ways that we give out about cars parking up on the footpaths. The load of the narrative was very similar because they are the dominant mode of transport. Yeah, yeah. So we need to design so everyone is equal. And so you're saying Denmark, well, how did they achieve it in Denmark? What have they done to make much it? More, um, much, much more segregated, much more okay. segregated and, and, and even just the priority in the junctions okay. is different now. I like, it's quite you know, technical. It is, it is kind of technical, it is. Like, and do you know what, our Dublin cycling campaign are brilliant. They have really, they, they've gone from being, um, they've evolved. Like at the start, like people, they were kind of just given out and, and that brought it into, the, like, you know, people public were taking, yeah. people, people, public discussion. But they have taken the time now that they, I, we had a great presentation by one of them came into us in, um, into TU Dublin last week. And they have sat down with the Bus Connects and um, documents, a group of 15 of the, of the, and have actually pointed out like places where it needs improvement, but I've done it in a really, you know, informed way and you know they're communicating much better now and they you know they're kind of getting in on different groups and it's no longer that kind of anarchy of giving out now they have there is uh, another group that are doing that because there's a place for that too yeah. but um it, it, like it, it's great that like these are people who are using these spaces they're very informed they're working together to get narrative going around it it's, it's brilliant so you speak a little bit so if we're, if we're moving towards this like essentially just all we're talking about at the moment is a lot of like improving the urban landscape improving lives in an urban capacity yeah everybody needs to kind of like get out of that from time to time as well right to decharge discharge yes. whatever yes, it is yes 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 like how how can you build that in what's the like you know i think we know what the value is a little bit we talk about that a lot and a lot in our podcasts as well in terms of mental health from forest bathing those sorts of things but mm -hmm. how do you facilitate that if you can't bring drivers back into cycling how do you get everyone else out of the city for a bit of, or, or do it in the city, or what do you do? Do it in the city, do okay. it in the city, yeah. So, um, th so my PhD was around walkability. Walkability was the term I used for it. And what I found is like people working in public health just saw, and public representatives as well actually, saw it as a place, a recreational facility to go for a walk, right? Um, urban designers, architects saw it as a livable village. You could get access all of your facilities within that 10 minutes. Engineers were much more likely to just say footpaths, crossing. Yeah. Like, it, so it's, yeah. it's, it, 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 but it's, it comes in our, it, yeah, it's, it's our training and, like, and it, yeah. made, it made sense. Yeah. But it, it is important for us to have somewhere to go for a walk, mm. right? Um, now, obviously going to the sea and having that, like we call, I called it um, like the um escapism scale i kind of it's a large scale somewhere you can go to like an urban park a greenery or a seafront or green and blue spaces you know you've talked about it before they're so valuable um particularly trees right and um there's um this neuropsychologist um esther sternberg like i just i just get so excited every time i read her book i can only read a chapter at a time and put it down like it's brilliant but she was describing like trees and gothic architecture is quite similar as well that um, every leaf is the same shape, but in different sizes. And that's really calming for our brain. And that's why like nature spaces, like, they just relax our brain. But there are places like that Gothic architecture, like streets, like Georgian streets are quite calming because there's a lot of the similar and same there. Now, 
like I know suburbia does that too, but there's cars parked outside and there's like there's other stressors in the environment. But yeah. sometimes maybe that's why people find some people find kind of suburbia okay. appealing and attractive. It's a predictable environment. It's a predict well it's more that the, the, the same the, shape. Yeah. The fractal you know, nature of it or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. kind of relax us. That's so cool. like you know, and urban oasis like um, places like Trinity that you're in an urban context but you go into this courtyard and you have this kind of you have this little tranquil space within it. There's there's lots of opportunities even here. We're in a very urban, busy part of the city, but we've got a lovely, nice, tranquil space. You come in here, you sit down, it just, the pace reduces. Um, so, and pocket parks like present that, but well-designed pocket parks present this. And there are so many little, like little green spaces with lovely planters closed off in around the city, mm -hmm. and, you know, and yeah. then they should be open. And I remember the first time I discovered the Ivy Gardens when I was like in my early twenties. It's an amazing place. Oh my God. <laughs> So yeah. good. Now, in all honesty, I was engaging some antisocial behaviour there. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was my early twenties. I don't think it's like what's nice about Ivy Gardens is that actually continues. But there seems to be a sort of an, an acceptance from both sides that you're still engaging with really, really nice spot. Like it's just yeah. a lovely place to be. You've got that amazing waterfall, which is designed by that Guinness guy or whatever, and uh -huh. the rose garden. And there's so many aspects to it that are like, and within an urban environment, I don't think there's anywhere really kind of like that in, in Dublin because it. Yes, it's closed off, but the closing off actually going to help in that situation because well, yeah. it feels like an oasis, right? Yes, so yes. There's a, bit, there's a bit of, a, I suppose, a bit a, a, a tension between like closing it off too much and. But the land uses in that area yeah. kind of require it to be closed off. It yeah. would be brilliant if we had more people living in the upper floors of those buildings. Yeah. Like you take Central Park in New York, we're like that's another thing that we need to we, we need to address is actually the space over shops and the space over, and living in those spaces again and. Mm. And, and even in the kind of the, the county town, the country towns, that's that's where people used to live. Yeah. And now when in the evenings when the shops close and people leave that space, it becomes an urban yeah. desert. Yeah. And Henry Street, it was another was one place that's what people brought up that like Henry Street is so vibrant all day and come shop closed down and because they because they put in particular in Henry Street they have shutters, that even makes it more it becomes a little, it becomes a gully. So somewhere that is so walkable in daytime became such an unwalkable space in the evening. Yeah. You're isolated in that space. That's yeah. a real challenge. What I love is that people started painting those shutters in a lot yes. of parts of the city. And like it's happened around the world, obviously, but, yeah. but in Dublin, it's sort of, it's surprising. Some places like there's a place called Butler's Tires just off Harold's Cross. And mm -hmm. they've got this amazing, beautiful kind of like, I don't know, it's like a, a pie or like a fried egg on the front of the shutter. Like it's not in any way to do with the business, it's not advertisement, but it's just art for art's sake, but it mm -hmm. totally changes the nature of feet, like when you see that shutter down. Yeah, yeah. Um, Everything, even, you know, when you see people changing bins, painting on bins yeah. that are yeah. around the place. Yeah. Um, where I live in Greystones, there's, they cut down, you know, they had to coppice a load of the trees that are on the main kind of road, and they were just kind of tree stumps, and then people started carving them into like footstool, um, toadstools right. and oh, cool. painting them. Oh, nice. And I like, love it that. just makes you smile. You're yeah, going around and you see that little bit of something, and you're like, oh, yeah. Nice. And the Happy traffic nice. signal boxes. Yeah, yeah. There's so many examples of it, and there's there's wonderful stuff going on in, in Cork where the um, can't remember the name of the group, but they're reimagining Cork. I think they might be calling. But they identified derelict sites and you know went in and did like urban art on them. And the, there's a lot of value being put on it. Waterford are doing a massive amount of like publicly commissioned like street art. Um, in Bogota, I was over in Bogota there um, last year and they, like, they they work with the street artists to do those whole streets where places where they had a wall and houses behind it where we just leave it. They had like fa fabulous murals all along it. But they also had these two big buildings where they said, there was this one junction, it was kind of like a public transport crossing hub and but there's a million people crossing through that junction every day because uh, yeah, in, in and out of the city. And so they decided that they've four or five pieces of urban art commissioned in there. And it, it gives such a fabulous visual interest, mm. you know, like, it's like an art, it's like a, an, well, an art museum. Yeah. 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 Is there a study around how graffiti that's just done on walls randomly, like the one behind us there, yeah. versus commissioned street art that's been put onto a space affects us visually when we're walking past I don't it know, behavior. but it would be a really interesting study. I'm Would sure someone has. Mental health or health yeah. outcomes yeah. or whatever. Because yeah. we, talk, we, we knock on graffiti a lot, and yeah. then there's also this like counter. It's a, sort of the same as that wrist thing. It's like, if it's good graffiti, yeah. it's really good Fine, for us. Yeah. And if it's rubbish, we really frown on people doing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, like, there has to be a learning that comes at some yeah. point, and there's also space that's free and yeah. it's being used. And I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about it, but it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Certainly, when I was in Crumlin in our local park, 
you know, it was a bit grotty. Like, yeah. honestly, there was always graffiti on it. It wasn't particularly nice looking. There were no bins because they got set on fire the whole time. It was just dog poo in bags hanging off every tree, everywhere. Yeah. And there were big groups of people who hung out, yeah. engaging in antisocial behaviour. And it was scary when you were walking on your own. Like, yeah. you wouldn't walk through it yeah. at night because if something happened to you, people would be like, why would you, a doing? single woman, yeah, yeah. walk through that path yeah. at night yeah. time? And you want to. Like, you have the inclination, I have the inclination to go, oh, I'd love to just, I'm on my way home from work, I want to just like distance myself from all the stuff that's happened in the day. It would be nice to take that route through the park home and get that space. Yeah. But you don't because of what's going on around you. Uh, yeah. And it's such a fine line though, isn't it, between inclusiveness and I think when you embrace all aspects of a culture, of society, like the counterculture stuff, mm. without, like, it's funny, yeah, because if you, if you endorse it too much, then it's co-opted and it's just advertised. Yeah. But if you resist it, then it becomes this well anti-social thing, which is kind of which which, which whatever move, moves people away from that space as well, or kind of restricts access to that space from other people. It's really difficult to get that right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And I think there's a lot. What's nice about it is like I know planning is your gig, but I like the fact. I, oh, I like the fact. I like when things are maybe not totally planned. Like there's incidental yeah. things, mm. like people who did that, um, like gorilla gardening or mm-hmm. the gorilla knitting, knitting thing that happens. You know, where things are not actually allowed for they're actually kind of breaking the law but they're just kind of they come out of this sort of like wellspring of people just wanting to change their environment in small ways and to provide something it, it makes such a monster difference. like you're talking about the like obviously when we're sponsoring them doing the boxes and that sort of stuff it's it's amazing but it's also nice to allow for a little bit of like tactical urbanism what's that called tactical urbanism tactical, okay right <laughs> <laughs> of course it's a term <laughs> yeah yeah and I was, I was actually when, we talk, when, we, when you were speaking there I was like oh no I, I need to bring this up because and, and this is where um, groups like um, so the street street feasts oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, they close yeah, off yeah. streets um, tidy towns community groups they're groups that come together like and even where, I, where I'm living we have a, like, a, 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 like a, just a residence association that has we have a shed where people can borrow um, like gardening equipment so you don't have to have your own or cool. whatever really yeah like but those little groups those little local groups they, they're the people who will do the planter boxes and will do yeah. the knitting and, yeah. and, and they're vitally important and it's the sense of ownership. The ownership is really important. That's if exactly the council right. comes in and does it, people don't have the ownership. They won't maintain it or they won't necessarily engage with it. But if it is a local group or if the school does it, people are kind of going, oh, look what the school kids did. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, that's really important in the community building. I want to ask just one question quickly. What can we be doing in, in planning and urban planning around supporting elderly people to be less isolated? Yeah, villages, villages. and. Like even the public transport, like um, one of the stories that I, I keep telling is that there's this woman near me in Kimmage who um, comes out every evening, rail hair or snow, she is out meeting people coming off the bus, just saying hi. Wow. Right, she's like, she just comes out to say hi wow. and she's standing out there because she recognizes that like, she doesn't meet people all day, but here she has interactions with people. For good mental health, people need to have um, people around them. They need to meet people, right? They need to have um, a place where they feel comfortable. So even if within their home it's stressful, that they have somewhere else that they can go to relax and calm. Or if it's their school or workplace is stressful, they have somewhere else. So they have to have a place. And the third thing they need is a purpose. This purpose can be anything. It can be that your purpose in the day is just to say hi to your neighbor every day right, when you see them. It can be as simple as that, but something that you feel that you do um, that has a better good of it, and when we have all three of those, um, we're in good. We're in a good place. But if we if we lose just any one of those three, it can really affect our mental health. Very interesting. And yeah. you said an interesting statistic before we started filming that, in fact, isolation has a bigger burden. Yeah, a burden of disease like um, loneliness is estimated at up to 25 percent of premature mortality is associated with loneliness. Wow. So that's yeah. just something we need to consider. It's yeah. Something that we have to be. Yeah, because that's like design. I mean, we, we you think about that's that's more ta- like all course mortality, but way before that is just the effect that it has on people's like mental health and the quality of life while they are alive. Yes, exactly. yes, yes. Which is, I mean, that's that's going to be profound. It's probably going to be more than ha- more than fifty percent, possibly. Who knows? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah. We, we we sort of understand when we look at like you know we look at nature programs. We were talking about lion cubs earlier on. We know that we're like there's we look at socialized other animals or social life or even, even just like a good fuzzy cafe and you're kind of like, oh that looks really cool yeah yeah but for some reason we kind of necess- necessarily kind of try to exclude ourselves from that in our daily lives just that buffering kind of thing isn't that mechanism we need to kind of overcome that this is a great version of it i suppose yeah, yeah. Like, as we're here with skaters around us i don't know if you've heard most of our podcast <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, we'll yeah, find yeah. out in the editing room um, <laughs>
hopefully so but it is lovely to feel that like there is an inclusivity there and there's lots of people as we've been here who mm -hmm. come and kind of move through the place use yeah. it as you were saying as like an open kind of walk through people are beginning to kind of sit down there with their kids and and use the playground and then the skate park it's great. and that is and it is all levels of society and all types yeah. of humans here which is yeah. cool and as we open spaces like this what you notice over time and it happens around public transport stops as well is you'll have cafes will pop up and um, I, know, I know people say oh it's gentrification money's coming into the neighborhood but mm. actually it's the social opportunity that when people see that there are people using this space they're like oh we're going to open a shop here yeah. or we're going to open and, and they have the footfall and I was actually trying to explain this to um, uh, one of the, our local shopkeepers like because I am along that Kimmage um, bus route where we have community not corridor signs up everywhere and it's driving me insane seeing these because actually the bus will contribute to community i get their concerns about the streetscape and the street design but that's not finalized yet the 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 urban design piece and landscaping hasn't really been formulated to to, to specific design yet right so the, the the discussion piece is out there but um buses because people walk to the bus stop and they're walking they all converge on a route there's more Incidental um, interactions, first of all, amongst the people, they see more people, but there's more footfall outside those shops. Like if you like, and you will pop in and get your your milk, or you pop in and you know, you know if it's a small pharmacy, or a coffee shop, or pick up a birthday cake, or yeah, pick yeah, up yeah. a cake. Oh, you will do that, yeah, really or go to the loo. Yeah. It's always like you're in parks, so or you're going to the bus stop, yeah. you're yeah. waiting, and you need to go to the loo. If you go into that place that's a cafe, yeah. and you see what they have, you're much more likely to go. Oh, well, I'll just get a tea as well, or the yeah. next time maybe I'll come early and I'll sit and I'll read my book, and then blah blah. blah. Yeah. But then it's really important on the flip of that, and this is something that did definitely strike me coming through liberties. As it has been gentrified, it is happening. Is that when footfall goes up, um, so do rates, and rates then exclude a lot of the older businesses that you know um, have been there for years, who form a really important part of that community and their their uniqueness. And again, in urban design um, terminology, is the imageability of an area, and it's really important that we don't all build the same. Like and this happened with a lot of high streets in the UK and people are going, oh, why why is the high street dying? Is because there was no novelty in it. It was no longer a destination. Whereas when, when people say rat mines, you can you can pitch your rat mines in your head. Whereas if you say like Lucan, you're kind of going, mm, what's, like, the, what's what's yeah. different? Image, yeah, 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 no, no. Like I might be unfair in parts of Lucan, but you you know what I mean. They're kind of saying a suburban area. It's kind of samey. What road are you talking about? So like embracing what makes that community unique and not like you know driving them out because something else successful has come into the area is very important as well cool nuanced isn't yeah. it isn't it though absolutely there's so many bits to it but yeah. i think it's just that like even having the conversation i mean that's what we're here to do yeah. and, like i think it's great that they're putting out to the public uh, not public public consultation that you know these people have a voice then and, you know mm. whether it goes you know your way or somebody else's way at least there's been there's been a, an approach made it's not yeah. kind of like rough shot over the yeah and so. on communication actually around yeah. those 30,000 submissions that the NTA have got there were a lot of positive in that because sometimes people say oh submissions are all negative uh -huh. and it's really important that people when they are for something that they actually speak up for it yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's it's not often done yeah. And when they went around to the, they went around a lot of shopping centres and things, and engaged people in conversation. And when they actually showed them, and talked to them about how how this will impact you and what's happening outside, people are actually going, well, oh, that's great because I just didn't understand it, and I have people telling me it's bad, so I don't know where I sit with this. But actually, again, talking about how it directly affects them, you know, there's a lot of positive in that as well. Cool. Well, you've certainly shifted my opinion on the the rat mines thing because I think I like as a cyclist as well I was like most of my customers are coming in we've just gone through this you know the first political campaign that I've significantly involved myself in which is like bad on supplements and now this is yes. kind of coming as well and people are talking about it. you suddenly feel kind of busy like okay, we're gonna do something about it and now I'm kind of like okay well that's kind of like made me kind of slow my road a little bit I'm gonna kind of yeah. like maybe investigate a little bit more and not just and there still is a piece to be like you know it, it is not perfect yes and there are problems with it but highlighting those problems but getting what like and I think I think what's missing from the narrative and, and the conversation is the bigger picture about why it is so important for us to have yeah, this yeah, network yeah, that's it though isn't it because it's so easy to go into I mean but it comes back to everything though doesn't it when you think about community so much of our stuff that inhibits community is us looking after ourselves first mm -hmm. and not after that greater good and naturally when we look after the greater good there's going to be compromise for ourselves for our personal yeah. stuff and so when you're hearing the stuff about the corridor and then taking away the gardens and stuff you're like Jesus but those people like bought their houses and mm. at the value of their house and they have a lovely garden. That's mm. terrible if they yeah. lose. Like, how can they yeah. even do that? 
Whereas the but the point, the point is, it. is it's, it's, a, it's better for all, yeah. Yeah. not for the individual. And like if, if we celebrate those people for giving up that exactly. personal space in order to yeah. facilitate this, no, that's, that's a huge deal. Those people deserve a massive clap on the back. Huge. Yeah, yeah. Uh, huge. But as opposed to just fighting for them to keep the garden. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, Who yeah, knows? yeah. 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 And, the, um, and also, the people buy into neighborhoods because they have this perception of it being this lovely village. Oh. And when you look at the places where the, pre, where the premium, where the most expensive places to buy around the city they are the perception this place with this perception of village yeah. but there are people moving into these places for that but they're not engaging in that in and some lifestyle. of these very expensive places are losing their sense of village as well like yeah. and people it, and people who are using the space are actually people traveling into the space not necessarily people living in it that's interesting so it becomes a postcode and it becomes a postcode and an ideal so the ideal actually is to have more places replicating that that are look at what's successful about those why is it we want to live there and let's make other places more like that yeah. they are that you have a, a recreational space within walking distance right so that you have a seafront a park or, so put something like that in that you have a good public transport link most of those places you'll notice are along good public transport links and the bus connects will provide that to so many more places as a result of that that you have the village is the other thing so that's that pocket of shops and it doesn't have to be in one space so around Portobello area it's like lots of little kind of crossroads with little pockets of shops it's not that there is an identifiable village centre but it has a village feel yeah. um, so then the streetscape is really important that you feel safe in that that everywhere is overlooked so you don't have the places where you, like here that where that graffiti is there's no the overlooking it yeah, yeah. yeah and you will notice that now where you see smashed bottles they're not being overlooked yeah. um, there's um, and th there's a place for everyone and that the footpath is sufficiently wide and there's even subtleties in the footpath design like sandwich boards have a purpose but when you're using a cane and you're bashing off there's a lot of people who use canes blind people with canes that have repetitive strain injuries on their wrists from banging off things really? yeah oh, yeah and tactile paving while it's we, we think of putting it in for blind people it's actually it's actually quite bad for them it's not really awkward for them and we don't always have a consistent message on how we design our road crossings either so yeah, yeah. so there's, there's a lot of subtleties so yeah, yeah so many subtleties yeah but i mean what's nice is it's like it's russ and Irby, it's a bit of wilderness in here and green yeah. is so important mm -hmm. and like even in my park as i was cycling into work today just the the one off um, uh, dolphin road the little kind of present yeah this morning the canada geese are gathering they're about to make their flight back home oh, wow. for the summer and it's like there was about i'd say about ten thousand of them yeah they're right beside the the newly put in newly installed kind of outdoor workout kind of yep. stations and you're kind of looking at that and just that overlap of one and the other it's lo it's lovely conflict it's a really nice thing and i think from what, why we do this podcast outdoors is all about kind of the different conversations that you have when you're exposed to something visually that's expansive and, and if wilderness comes in, if like if bird life blocks in, you feel like something's good about that. We're doing something mm, right, yes. you know? Yeah. It's Great. nice not to be isolated in the little box. That's the other yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah. Being part of the community encourages that free thinking that yeah. we have, where if we were in a studio and it was just us talking about us, yeah. it yeah. gets a bit isolationist. It can do. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. sound quality is better, though. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, yes. Compromise, yes. like we're saying. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. The greater good. Oh, oh. <laughs> Let's yeah. hope so. Uh, could we better wrap it up? Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the chat. You're very welcome. I'm very welcome. I feel like we've covered loads. <laughs> have you on like 20 times to dive in much more deep into each of those little little areas. Yeah, maybe we'll no have problem. To do podcast 101 to all of our guests. Yeah, absolutely. We need to get that started. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, so we'll chat to you again soon. Great. Thank you for doing it. And best of luck with thank uh, you fighting for you know the the inclusive society that you're doing, which is it's amazing, amazing yeah, work. It's lovely work, and I know you're yeah. you're being paid for it. It's not a charity, but it's it's a really important. Job. Yeah. The research is charity because we have to do that in our own time. Okay, it, okay. I'm in a teaching college, so essentially we're you know we're paid to teach, but we do that we do our research on our own time. Oh, wow. But we've set up a new masters along with a, a group. Um, so I'm in civil engineering school, and uh, as some of us in planning school. We've set up a new masters in transport and mobility, okay, and it's yeah, yeah. Um, inclusive access. So we we just want people who have worked in transport, but in transport related you can be from a community group you can be a public representative to all come together to talk around everything wow. i've talked about today Great. so that's my little plug for that Deadly. and how can people get hold of you if they want to do that so um so in, in tu dublin if you look up transport and mobility okay. you'll, you'll okay. find us yeah and okay. we'll put that underneath we'll put yeah, link to that. and yeah. also to the you mentioned i think a book and then also a documentary that yeah so nice. the healing so spaces and yes. yeah 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 cool we'll, stick we'll those those below. Definitely. Well. Okay. nice one okay thank you guys for watching or listening <laughs> and uh, we'll talk to you very soon debbie bye, Have a good one. bye. bye.